people in here? I don't know how to act, Jerry. Why is it so quiet in here when I get up here? <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Good little boy. How are you doing, Nathan? You changed your hair? It's good. Straightened it. Oh, yeah, that's good. So, Megan? Is that a Megan thing? No? Nope. Oh, okay, gotcha. No? Nope. <laughs> gotcha. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Let me uh, get a couple announcements out of the way here so we can get going. The first thing is, do you see this chart over here? Do you like my professional handwriting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't like it. All right. Now, you know we started last week this Operation Christmas Chart. We just saw a video on it, right? We said we had to go off $250 for 25 boxes. Last week we collected $160. So we're getting there, huh? Now you'll notice I have a space above $250. That's for you really generous people who are going to get more. So when we get over $250, we're going to buy stuff for the boxes, okay? But what a great beginning that is, right? So guess what I'm doing today? During meet and greet, guess what I'm doing? Um, Alright, so when I come up and shake your hand, don't run away. But if you got any extra dollars or fives or tens or anything you want to throw in there, it's much appreciated because we're going to go for the Operation Christmas Child. Um, we already have some donations in there for today, so we're going to be pretty close probably after today to the 250, which is a good thing. Um, in case you're interested in donating items to the Operation Christmas Child, downstairs there are plenty of lists of supplies that are suggested. So if you're looking for guidance on what to bring or buy for these kids, that list will tell you for boys and girls what it is. But they're down there on the display uh, table down there by the stairwell, in case you didn't see it. All right, second announcement. Miss Bonnie Hamilton, who passed away, we all know, her funeral is October 11th. That's still the date, right, Ron? Yeah. All right, and the church is invited. We're going to have it here at this church. Okay, so be aware. The, the visitation will be from 10 to 11, and then the service will start at 11 o'clock. All right, so mark it on your calendars if you're interested to come and celebrate the life of Bonnie. October 11th at 11 o'clock for the service there. All right, that's all the announcements I got. Oh, uh, well, no, I, I got one more. Tuesday night is ladies' night. Is that right, Big Night? Yes. So be aware, um, that night you're going to discuss the funeral and dinner for the, the Hamilton family, so just be aware. Tuesday night at 6 o'clock? Yeah. that work? Okay, okay. All right, cool. All right, anybody else got an announcement they need to make? Tickets. Tickets? Frank to us. Oh, you're selling tickets? I'm selling tickets, and I need money back from tickets back. <laughs> so I don't want money to make. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So... So buy more tickets, says Janie, yes. and give her the money of what you sold already, says Janie. That's right. We have four more books. So that's 20? 20 more dozen to sell? So that's it. Just 20 more dozen. That'll work. Everyone's selling them what they got. Ow. Okay. Very cool. All right. Anything else? Any other announcements? All right. I got one, actually. If you are doing a shoebox thing, would you, um, I'm going to try and supply all the crayons for them, so... If you could choose another okay. item on there. So Judy says she's buying crayons for the box. For all 25 boxes? Yeah. All right. So be aware. You don't need to worry about crayons. Apparently Judy's got it. All right. In fact, I'll make a list. I told Judy. I'll put a list down there this week of what we already accumulated. That way you can look at it and see we don't double buy. Sounds like a good plan. All right. We're there. But let's go to the Lord prayer. Let's get this service open. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name in all the world. Hallowed be your holy, holy, holy name, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace and your mercy on us. Thank you, Father, for giving us a way back to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. How can we come up with the words, Father? Thank you for what you have done for us. Father, we are here to worship you this morning in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. Father, please know that we are bending our knees to you not only every day, but especially this morning as we gather to discuss your business. Please help us, Father, submit to you as we're needed. Submit to your ways so we can live and learn the way you want us to do it. Father, please know that we are here to worship you. That is why we are here. We are not here because of us. We are here because of you, Father. Please, please be well honored today with this celebration as we are here to honor you. Father, I ask that you help us be close to you. Father, please, at all times, 
let us understand that intimacy with you is what we crave and what we desire. We need that every day, Father. Please help us be faithful, Father, knowing all the time that you are completely faithful. You are never not faithful, Father. Help us be like you. And Father, we've had many petitions today. We lift these people up. We lift Jane's unspoken request up to you. Brittany's knee surgery that she's going to go through. Carla, this whole job situation that they're doing at the Nazarene Church. And then Judy with her situation with the elders. All these petitions, Father, are sent to you. Knowing that you are the faithful one and that you will supply all the needs no matter what without exception to us. Please help us accept your resolution, Father. Please help us be comfortable and peaceful and have strength through these ordeals that we go through, Father. Because we understand it's your will that needs to be done, Father. It's not us. It is your will that will be done. Father, we love you. We love you more than we can show. Please know that, Father. We love you. Please bless us this morning as we discuss your business, as we get intimate with your Son, the Christ. And please, Father, the mercy that I mentioned earlier, please supply us with this mercy at all times. We cannot live without your mercy. Please help us understand we need your mercy every day. We are thankful for you, Father. We are thankful for your love. We are thankful for your word. We are thankful that you have shown us a way back to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Be grateful for him. That song kind of reminds us of that. Are you guys coming over? I was back there singing that, thinking about how I used to be. Are you coming over? And how things have changed over the decades. Okay. And that is specifically highlighted with something I did yesterday. So, when I was 33 years old, after spending eight years in the Army, I graduated to the real life as an Army NCO, non commissioned officer. I was a big, bad sergeant. Tough guy, right? Guess what I did yesterday? I built a house for a stray cat. <laughs> Something's wrong, Jerry. <laughs> Good night. What a blessing it is to have been changed. <laughs> All right. That's confession good for the soul, they say, right? So, All right. Last week we began our series, right? Our new series in the book of Jude. Or Judah, as I will, will hear me say quite a bit today. And we explored the first three verses of Jude. Now we saw how Judah introduces himself as being of Christ. Emphasizing his deep spiritual relationship with Jesus as his servant. Something that surpasses what he talked about with the other guy. Remember what he said about his brother, brother, James? He said, ah, he's just a brother. <coughs> Now Judah also reminds us that God is our Father and that believers are kept in Christ. There is no better place to be, friends, than to be kept in Christ. That is an assurance that you can live with every day. It's an assurance knowing that God has loved you in the past, He's loving you right now, and He's going to love you forever and ever and ever. Those who belong to Jesus Christ are going to experience this enduring love. This enduring love that transforms us, right? And equips us to become servants of God. And then we can conclude, conclude it by reflecting on the salvation that is available to all who choose to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Once saved, Judah calls us to action, doesn't he? What does he say in this very early on in his letter? He says, we must contend for the faith. That is a call to action. And that is a call to action that has been entrusted to believers once and for all, he says. Today, as we move forward with verses 4 through 7, I want to revisit last week's scripture to provide context for today. But I specifically want to talk a little bit more about verse 3. So if you'd like, please open up your Bibles to Jude chapter 1. Guess what? There's only one chapter. <laughs> so it's not that hard. And if you don't know, it's the last book before Revelation. Alright, so find it there. It'll be on the screen as always, so please follow along if you'd like as we read God's holy word. Jude, verses 1 through 7. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, 
I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all time handed down to the priests, or saints, I'm sorry. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long before marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, says Jude, though you know everything once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These He has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Since they, in the same way as these angels, indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Heavy hitting words, isn't it? Only seven verses. Seriously, heavy hitting words by Judah. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for today. Thank you again for your word, your life giving, life sustaining word. Father, as we discuss your business today, please be with me as the words come out of my mouth need to represent what your intent is. Please, Father, let me speak no untruth today, and if I do even get close to any untruth, please correct on the spot, Father. This is all about you today and not about us. So please, Father, be with not only me, but this whole entire congregation as we open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Now the faith that we talked about last week in verse 3, it's an eternal faith. God's truth that never changes. It doesn't matter what culture you belong to. It doesn't matter what nation you are from. It doesn't matter what time period you live in. This faith that Judah's talking about was true 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago. It is going to remain true for all eternity. That is why Judah informs us, tells us, encourages us to contend for this faith. This faith that is forever. We are supposed to fight and uphold this faith. Faith, I'm sorry. Now, I've been preaching. How long have I been at this church? Anybody know? Four years. Four years? Did you say four years? Yep, you're right. Good job. Because I struggled thinking about it. Like, how long have I been here? You all know. I mean, well, no, let me put it this way. I have definitely been here almost four years. And if you haven't picked up a core belief of mine, one that I've been espousing since the beginning, this is a good place just to talk about it for a moment. There are individuals today who consciously attempt to diminish God's Word and disconnect the revelation of the Hebrew Bible. What's the Hebrew Bible? The Tanakh. It's the Tanakh, the Old Testament, from the message. They try to disconnect the Old Testament from the New Testament. Why do people want to do that? It doesn't make sense to me. Why would you want to do that? Well, because the other... I mean... I guess theologically is the right word to say. The whole Bible shows us something critical, doesn't it? It's the whole Bible that shows continuity. And what I mean by that, it means that the foundational truths of our faith that is first revealed in Genesis and then throughout the Torah, the writings and the prophets, the Old Testament, these foundational principles, these are core fundamentals that carry over from the Old Testament into the New Testament. These core fundamental truths of God are not just present in the New Testament. They are a continuation of what God set forth, starting with Genesis. Yet some people claim the Old Testament is no longer relevant, that it should be unhitched from the New Testament. You know what they call that, friends? They call that replacement theology. That Jesus Christ replaced something when He came to earth. Jesus Christ didn't replace anything of God. He is God. He did not replace anything. You know what Jesus Christ did? He continued God's plan of redemption that was set forth from the beginning. Now when you ignore the message of the Old Testament, you cannot fully grasp the New Testament. You all have been learning that in our Genesis class, haven't you? 
better understanding of just Genesis is helping you with your New Testament theology. But friends, you will not, and, I, and I'm just going to go to the grave spe uh, preaching this, you will not experience the full anointing. You will not be fully led by the Holy Spirit. You will never gain the right perspective to serve God and fulfill His will if you do not follow the entire book, not just part of it. You won't. That's why it's so critical to understand that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one unified, divinely inspired book without error. It equips both men and women for God for every good work. And Judah says, very clearly in the beginning, we must contend for the faith that was once and for all handed down to us, right? That's what he's talking about. Now in verse 4, Judah begins to warn us about those who attack this faith I just talked about. Let me read it to you. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior, and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Judah is telling us certain individuals have secretly infiltrated the house of God, sneaking into fellowships among believers, and they're not even detected. But we also learn of their true motives of these people that are doing this. Now think about it, friends. If you look at the world and on your church experience, some of you decades, have you seen people infiltrate a church that have destroyed things? You better believe you have. What Judah's talking about is absolutely correct, and it is not going away. These individuals that he's talking about are heretics. And heretics have a key trait, a, creed, a key trait that is designed to divide. When someone promotes heresy, the goal is to divide God's people. Why? Why would that be their goal? All the things they can do. Well, it's because the enemy knows the truth. And the enemy says, if everybody else knows the truth, it's not going to go well for me, the enemy. So let me divide them. Let me think that what I'm doing is better or more intrusive or better for them than what God says. Even though, friends, we have the truth in front of us, people are infiltrating God's house to separate us from this. Do not think, friends, that accepting falsehood just so you can preserve unity, do not ever think that is the right thing to do. Sitting together, pretending everything is just fine while believing different things than God's Word, that's not unity, friends. That is a false peace that isn't even close to worth preserving. Yet, that's what's being promoted out there. We need to be people who contend for this, God's Word, for the faith. Because these people that are creeping into congregations are trying to separate us from this. These individuals, Jude tells us, were long ago marked out for condemnation. Now that brings us to a very, very important truth. The truth of condemnation. And that is a real truth, friends. The truth of condemnation is coming. It is on its way. The word for condemnation really means judgment. As we move from this age into the very last days, one of the defining characteristics of that time that we're talking about is this increasing outpouring of God's judgment. The judgment will intensify and ultimately culminate in God's consuming wrath. Let me share another important truth while I'm with you, friends. If you are part of a congregation where the leader or the primary teacher, the preacher or the pastor, rarely, if ever, speaks about God's judgment and wrath, I am very comfortable in telling you, run as fast as you can from that church. Run as fast as you can. It's just that simple. Because when we look at the teachings of Jesus Christ the Messiah, many, many people often overlook how Christ spoke about judgment often. 
His parables frequently emphasize this thing. You cannot study his teachings without repeatedly, repeatedly encountering his warnings about judgment. It's over and over. It is the core part of his message, friends. Now, all people want to talk to you about is salvation and the grace of God. We need to talk about it. We got to have it. But I am telling you, friends, Jesus Christ has made it absolutely clear. The core part of his message is condemnation. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 9, we read about something called the fiery hell. It is Jesus Christ himself who says this. He's not quoting anybody else. He says this. He talks about it directly. So we have to understand, friends, judgment is very, very, very real. And the clearest and most powerful example of God's judgment is found where? On the cross. Where God poured out His wrath on His Son. Jesus took upon Himself that judgment of God, that wrath of God. That's ours, friends. That's ours. We own that. The penalty that belongs to you and I for disobedience to God, that's what He did for us. When we downplay judgment, when we kind of just hurry over and not talk about it, we not only diminish the significance of the cross, we diminish the significance of its power that Jesus Christ did. Without understanding that the judgment of Jesus Christ and that He bore for us, without understanding that, friends, we lose the full depth. We full, I mean, we don't even comprehend the full depth of what His sacrifice meant to us and accomplished. Continuing on in verse 4, we read, Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Jude describes these in individuals who have infiltrated the Congress or the, uh, the house of God. He calls them ungodly people. Now this word ungodly, that doesn't just refer to their sinful actions. Of course, if you're, if you're doing sin, you're ungodly. But it also implies a lack of the correct worship of God Almighty. It is crucial to understand that people who are ungodly have no genuine interest in worshiping God. Not only in worshiping God, but in worshiping God the way He says He wants to be worshipped. He commands us how to worship Him. When it comes to worship, we must avoid making the mistake that many, many congregations do today. So let me ask you, do you believe mankind, us, has the freedom to worship God in any way we want? Can we do that, friends? Any way we please, can we do it and call it worship of God? You can't do that, because we may think we have complete freedom in how we worship, the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says you have been set free so you can worship God. But it doesn't say you can do whatever you want to worship God. How do you worship God? How have you been set free to worship God? You crack it open and learn it. And you apply it to your life the way He says to do it. Not the way that says to do it. True worship has to be, it must be, it requires to be rooted in the Word of God. Worship that is disconnected from scriptural teachings and instructions, that's not worship. Now I watch and listen, maybe you do too, I watch and listen a lot of preaching. Both here in town with other preachers, towns and visit when I go see the kids, get to go to church with them. On TV, on the internet, on the radio, I try to saturate myself with as much preaching as I can. But what I've learned, friends, is in today's world, what, what much of what I'm witnessing is not worship of God. It is simply people singing songs so they can get a warm fuzzy and make themselves feel good. It is simply people thinking of themselves. It's often, I have found, friends, about creating an emotional experience or a sense of excitement to be there. 
Oftentimes I hear these preachers get up on stage. They talk about themselves so much and what they've gone through that week and how Jesus has helped them. And they'll tell you one line of scripture to kind of make it godly. Kind of a way to acknowledge, yeah, we're really here for you, God. When what they're speaking is all about themselves. Worship of God, friends, is not about us. It is not our warm fuzzy to have. Our worship is to be aimed at God Almighty. We are to be focused on Him and His purposes. So remember, the author of the book is Judah. What does his name mean? Judah means to throw up praise. A term that is directly connected to worship. Jude also implies gratitude in his letter, meaning that our worship must express thanksgiving to God. That last song we just sang is perfect. I don't know how Vicki does it, but that last song is perfect for today's message because we must have gratitude for correct worship of God Almighty. And as a verb, if you were to use Judah's name as a verb, it just means this, to throw or cast something like praise in a very specific way direction. That is the key to all of this, friends. Our worship must be directed towards God, not focused on what we enjoy or what we think is good. True worship is about honoring God, honoring God according to His words. It is not about seeking our own satisfaction. So what do these ungodly people that we read of, what do they do in verse 4? Well, we're told, right? Jude says they have exchanged the grace of God. Specifically, they've exchanged it for something called indecent behavior. What? Now, the Greek word for indecent behavior refers to how ungodly people have perverted, or perverted, I guess is the right way to say it, the grace of God, using it to indulge in things that please the flesh. They have replaced God's grace with things that appeal to their human senses. In doing so, they take the grace of God and misuse it, twisting it around to satisfy their own desires. This leads to something we can call sensual worship. A form of worship that glorifies and pleases our own human senses, rather than aligning with the purposes of God. It's a perversion of worship that focuses on personal gratification. That's our main focus instead of honoring God Almighty, the Creator of all things, and His holiness. Now, do you notice the reference to the Trinity here in this verse? Jude speaks of both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, while this passage doesn't explicitly mention the Holy Spirit, the reference to both the Father and the Son points to an understanding of the Trinity. Judah goes on to say that not only do these ungodly people distort the grace of God, but they also do something that's even harder to hear. They deny Jesus Christ. That's hard for me to hear. To deny Jesus Christ purposefully? Now the word deny in Greek you got to understand, in, in Greek literature, there's something called an active voice and a passive voice. And in Greek, this word deny, it is not what they call the active, they call it passive. That means something in Greek. It means something is causing these people to deny Jesus Christ. This isn't simply a matter of people being ignorant or unaware of Jesus Christ. This is something causing them to purposely deny the Christ. To purposely rebel against the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Their refusal to acknowledge God as master is driven by something, friends. And we've read already what it's driven by. It's a desire for sensual worship. Worship that pleases them. And it's a desire for indecent behavior. These people are driven... They are driven by themselves. And when we are driven by themselves, the flesh, that is when we are ultimately denying God in our lives. And in verse 5, 
we read of a very dire warning from Jude. Let's read it. Now I want to remind you, though you know everything once and for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, what happened? Subsequently, God destroyed all those who did not believe. Jude is reminding us believers of a very important truth. Although God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, He later destroyed those among those who lacked faith in Him. He destroyed them. And it serves as a warning that even those who have experienced God's salvation, they can still face judgment if they fall into unbelief. Jude emphasizes that knowing the truth isn't enough, is it? Just knowing the truth is not enough. Remaining faithful is the key. This verse highlights God's justice, showing that deliverance and judgment go hand in hand together. It warns believers to stay steadfast, steadfast in the faith. That's a huge warning. To stay steadfast in the faith. Friends, don't give back your salvation. Because you can. You can give it back. Don't do that, says Jude. Because look what happened when God took those people out of Egypt. They gave it back. What happened? Destruction happened. Even after experiencing God's blessing, God's grace of being delivered out of Egypt, He destroyed those. He destroyed those who gave it back. Now let's look at verse 6, where Jude gives an example of denying God that extends beyond us human beings. It's quite interesting what he writes. And angels who did not keep their own domain, so angels that did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These he has kept, meaning God has kept, in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. We see another principle that applies to all of God's creation. There is a clear division between those who are faithful and those who are unfaithful. In this example, the emphasis is on what, friends? It's on location. Do you see that? The emphasis is on location. The angels are not where they're supposed to be, are they? So it begs the question for everyone in this room. Are we where God wants us to be? Or are we on a place somewhere different than we have chosen for ourselves? These angels abandoned their proper dwelling place. They purposely abandoned it. The place where they were supposed to be. We need to ask ourselves if we're doing the same thing as these angels. I'm asking myself that. In fact, I still ask about it. Because I just told you, you know my life history. I made a lot of money. And now I'm here. Is this where I'm supposed to be? <coughs> Apparently so, huh? I didn't want to be here. I wanted to be in that other dwelling place, didn't I, honey? So I'm just every day asking, my, am, I, am I where I am supposed to be here? Please, Father, help me. Help me understand this is not about me. It is not about me doing what I want to do. This is about what you want. This is about your will and your purposes. So a lot of you, it's kind of quiet in here. A lot of you, this morning, I'd like to ask this question. You can answer it if you don't want, but you can answer this. How am I doing so far? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, nobody's throwing anything at me yet. <laughs> Jerry's like, I'm getting ready, Maddox. <laughs> no, I ask that because... I do. It's a serious question. I am kind of being uh, comical about it, but it is a serious question because some of you might hear this preaching today and think, Maddox sure isn't going to be very popular today, is he? <laughs> well, guess what, friends? Nowhere in this book, God's holy word, does it say, be ye popular, does it? What does it say? It says, be ye holy. Do not belong to that. Be separated from that. We are called to be set apart, friends, representing God's purposes and His will. We need to let go of this worldly idea that biblical teaching or going to church is supposed to entertain us and be all about us. It is not to be that way, friends. Worship of God is meant to change us. And it is meant to change us significantly. 
When we ask God to change us, what we're really saying is, God, convict me. We're asking Him to reveal the areas in our lives that displeases Him. To show us what needs to be corrected. If you don't think there's a list of things, Maddox, that God wants to change in your life, you're deceiving yourself, aren't you? So I have another question. Do you ever feel distant from God? Or frustrated spiritually? No, punk. If you do, we're encouraged to do what King David did. What did he do? He prayed a lot, didn't he? We are encouraged to pray like he did. Read one of his prayers here, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know this right here. Know my heart. Put me to the test, God, and know my anxious thoughts, Father. And Father, please see if there's anything inside of me that is hurtful. And if there is, what does King David say? Please help me. Lead me to the everlasting way. When we ask God to search our hearts and show us where we need to change, He will do so. He is faithful. Understanding, friends, spiritual growth requires change, doesn't it? We have to embrace that. Be ye holy. Are we not living in turbulent times right now? Aren't we? We are. Aren't we? You guys see it all around, right? And it's just going to get worse, guys. It's, just not, it's not going to get better. It's getting worse. This is just the beginning, it seems like. Look how Judah finished verse 6 by giving us an example. He says, He has kept an eternal change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. These angels left the place where God wanted them to be. They left it purposely and they chose to be somewhere else. And as a result of doing that, they are bound in eternal change, awaiting something. The day of judgment. These chains, as Scripture says, are chains of darkness. But this is no ordinary darkness Jude is talking about. Now the Greek word that is used here for darkness is not the typical word for darkness. If you go to our Genesis Bible class from the beginning, you will have remembered that in Hebrew, the word for darkness is hosek, which simply means absence of light. That's not the kind of darkness being talked about by Jude here. This is a different type of darkness than what we studied in Genesis chapter 1. This is a deeper kind of darkness. This is the kind of darkness that is described back in Exodus during the Exodus from Egypt. It's a kind of darkness where people are immobilized. They can't stand if they were sitting. They couldn't sit if they were standing. It's as if they were frozen in thick, oppressive darkness. Let me read it to you, friends. Exodus chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. So Moses reached out with his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. This is the darkness Jude's talking about right here. This thick darkness is exactly what these angels are experiencing, and it represents something. It represents the absence of God. It's not a light, illumination, darkness thing. It is the absence of God. Why? Because God is light. These fallen angels are not experiencing God. They have no connection to Him in this place that they're not supposed to be. And this disconnect from God, here's the bad news, it is only one dimension of hell. That is only one of the dimensions of hell. Don't think of hell just as the absence of God, of being separated from Him. It is also a physical time of suffering, isn't it? Isn't that what Jesus Christ said when He said, fiery hell? When he talked about being in a fiery hell, that is a physical thing, friends, where you are going to suffer in a way that can't be described, right? These angels are kept in this thick darkness 
bound by eternal change as they await the day of judgment. Their fate, their fate of these angels is a sobering reminder, reminder of what awaits anyone who does not belong to Jesus Christ. You got family and friends that don't belong? This is what awaits. Now in verse 7, Jude offers another very powerful example drawing from the history of Sodom and Gomorrah in the surrounding cities as it says. It reads, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them since they are in the same way as these angels so he's comparing them to, right? Indulged in sexual perversion and went on and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example and undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. These places just like the ungodly individual Jude has been warning about indulged in gross sexual immorality. Now the Greek word used here is rooted in the word porneia. What name do you know that's kind of like porneia? Well in English they call it pornography. And today pornography and sexual immorality they're not only widespread but they're even being endorsed. They are being even protected by governments. In fact, many countries have passed laws that approve and support various forms of sexual immorality. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have to stand firm, friends. We have to stand firm and speak out against this. No matter what names we are called, no matter what, friends, whatever the consequence is, we are to stand firm. That time of sexual immorality being forced on us that is happening in America right now, isn't it? Isn't that what's going on in America today? We are now being told by the government, the United States of America government, one that I went to Iraq for, that we that it's hate speech to talk negatively about homosexuals or same-sex marriage. We are being told by the government of the United States that we have to let boys go into girls' bathrooms because they think they're girls. We are told by the government of America then you better let these doctors start mutilating kids, taking off their genitals because they want to be a boy instead of a girl or a girl instead of a boy. As little as age 13, in the name of transgender. That's us, friends. You can't deny that. At this church, if I'm here, and I know you all agree, we're not going to suppress the truth of God for anyone. No one. We will not compromise the truth of God's Word at Highland Avenue United Brethren Church. There are those who's going to claim that for the sake of preaching the Gospel to the world that I should ignore or avoid these controversial topics. That would be a huge mistake for me, wouldn't it? If you and I are willing to compromise on these small things, we'll have no problem doing the larger things, will we? There is no compromise, friends, with the truth of God. None. That is exactly what Judah means. When he says, when he urges, contend for the faith. Some people might say, well, what about the outcome, Maddox? What will happen if we continue to promote God's word and it causes angst in the community? Or it will divide people away from each other or away from the church? What about that, Maddox? That isn't love, is it, Maddox? Friends, we cannot live in darkness. We cannot promote darkness. The outcome has nothing to do with us. The outcome belongs to God Almighty, the Creator of all things. Our responsibility is to hold fast to the truth and never, ever, ever compromise or turn away from it, no matter what the consequence is. If the short-term results seems disastrous, so be it. Because remember, God works. God gets it done. He is the one who takes bad into good notice. So it can happen. We must continually contend for the faith. If we compromise the truth, friends, nothing good or beautiful will ever come about. Nothing. We talk about God's will all the time in this church. Don't ever forget, friends, God's will is connected directly to the truth of God. That's the truth. That's God's will. Now, returning back to this text, 
Verse 7 tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities pursued sexual immorality and did something else. They went after strange flesh. The phrase, went after, implies a determined pursuit. That's pretty easy to understand. Much like the name Jacob. You all recognize the word Jacob from our Genesis Bible study, don't you? You know what his name means? It means to pursue something. To pursue it with tenacity. But in this case, they were pursuing something inappropriate, weren't they? They were pursuing something not fitting called strange flesh. It's just another phrase, friends, indicating indecent behavior. Ungodly people. Ungodly behavior. So what was God's response to Sodom and Gomorrah's pursuit of sin? What was His response? Well, He made them an example, didn't He? He made them an example of what you do when you decide to abandon your proper place. Sending fire and brimstone to rain down and consume everything. This was not just an isolated incident. It serves as a warning to every one of us this room that eternal fire awaits anyone who persists in rebelling against God. It awaits you if you choose not to belong to God. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed as an example of the eternal judgment that is coming. The judgment they suffered wasn't just a temporary one, was it? Did they rebuild the cities? Nope. It was a foretaste of eternal suffering. And Jude tells us this is going to happen. This not only is going to happen, it is forever and ever and ever. Now the word suffer here means to be brought under great pain or distress. Something that we're not, so those people are going to have to endure for eternity. Would you agree, friends? Jude is pretty serious business. Would you agree with that? What we're studying here in Jude, it challenges us, doesn't it, to examine our direction in this life? What path are we on? What have we chosen to do? Well, if you are on the wrong path, if you have traded in the grace of God for your own desires, if you have chosen to do what the angels did and be in the wrong place, then it's good that you're being challenged right now, isn't it? It's a good thing. Because there's a time coming. Perhaps it's this afternoon. Tomorrow. Who knows? But there is a time coming when the ability to change direction will no longer be available. So you've got to make a decision, friends. You've got to make a decision. Are you going to bow your knee to the Lord God Almighty, the true judge? Or are you going to choose to be in the wrong place like the angels did? It's a decision you need to make today if you haven't made already. If you wait, especially until things get worse, it's going to be too late, isn't it? Ask Noah's people. They didn't believe it. Guess what happened to them? They suffered God's judgment. And those of us who follow in the footsteps of people who lived around Noah or these fallen angels, we're going to, not me, they are going to face the same eternal fire and judgment that Solomon is going to make. It's a good place to stop. <laughs> so, what are you going to take out the doors today, guys? What are you going to take out the front doors with you? Are you wondering, by any chance, if you have traded in the grace of God? Have you traded it in for your own desires? Like some of those people in Egypt did? Can you imagine? Being rescued by God out of slavery and turning your back on Him? Are you wondering if you're dwelling in the wrong place and that you're being kept down by darkness? Like some of those angels were? Whatever it is that God has put on your heart, I just ask, friends, that you focus on that, not only today, but the rest of this week, and make a decision that you haven't made it already, to belong to the Christ. Does anybody need to do that right now? If you want to wait and do it afterwards, pick with me afterwards, I'll help you. But all you got to do is give your life to Christ. All you got to do, it is not a big deal. You just purposefully, with intent, decide to leave that and join Christ. That's what it is, friends. 
You pray to Him and tell Him, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you died and rose on the third day. I believe that I will be forgiven of my sin. I believe everything you say, Jesus Christ. I give my life to you, Jesus Christ, and I'm not going back. I am changing my place, Jesus Christ. Will you accept me? Every time. Every time, friends. That being said, until next week, oh man, let's sing out the last song. How do you pick the right song for the sermon? We don't even converse about that. <laughs> so, I was sitting there thinking again during that song, friends. If you are like me, were you abandoned God for a little while? Man, how blessed that He brought you back in. If that's you, how can we not leave here every day with gratitude for what He's done for us? Because man. Those people who don't belong to the Christ. How do we help them, folks? How do we help them? Especially our family members, the one we're crying over, right? Anyway, with that being said, whatever it is you're going to take out the door today, let me just pray it out here. Heavenly Father, thank you again. I'm, I don't have the words, Father. Thank you. Thank you for your life giving. Thank you for your forgiveness, Father. Thank you that you have sacrificed your son to give us a way back to you. How can we ever repay you, Father? How can we ever say the words, do the actions to express how grateful we are for what you did? Well, Father, I don't know that we can today, but there will be a day when we will be in your will in the new kingdom. What a glorious day that will be, Father. Thank you for that opportunity to be in your presence. And if those people we meet during this week are not with you, Father, please help us with the words. Whatever it is we need to be doing, please help us with that to help advance your kingdom. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.